I do not have the option to negotiate with a payer. Congressman Matt, you, if you're a small business owner, you can't negotiate. Is, is that because the pool that you're negotiating on behalf of is not large enough? Absolutely. Okay. I don't have enough employees, I'm not a or gamble, that I can go to Anthem or I can go to anybody in United Healthcare that said, this is what I want to pay. I'm small. I go to Anthem or United Healthcare. They tell me, based on an actuarial review of the health of my employees, we all know we have to fill out applications, based on the health of my employees, what's the cost So I can't negotiate. And I have to take what they're going to give me. And I'm very much afraid that I'm going to have to cost that to my employees. Ma'am, aren't you restricted also? Aren't you restricted by who you can, who you can check out? Like, are you not restricted by who you can check out? You can only check out insurance companies that are only in Ohio or only in Yeah. Um, That's your problem. Uh, thank you. Ma thank you. And, and this is a situation that we find small businesses that we're dealing with. And it really is a challenge because you've got to make very tough decisions. You know, reduce benefits, which many small businesses have done. You know, reduce benefits or completely drop coverage. And that just puts more people on the walls of the end of the sure. So it, it is a very real challenge that we're dealing with. Um, there, were, there have been several things brought up that I'd like to address. This issue about reading the bill. Uh, I, I know this has gained popular, uh, popular attention. Uh, as someone that's been a legislator for nine years, uh, I have read an awful lot of bills and have gotten pretty good at, at reading bills even if they're a thousand pages long. Um, not only have I read it, I put it on my website and we in several meetings have gone through it section by section. What I would encourage you to do um, is that it's not enough to read the bill. Because sometimes the, the language of the bill is ambiguous. Sometimes, as I already mentioned, as you get into committees, the language in the bill that you thought you were working from has changed. So it's very important to stay up with the amendment process. I know I had a lot of conversations with folks about cap and trade. Uh, they were talking about the original bill. They were talking about an analysis that had been done on the original bill. Well, when, you come to, when it comes time to vote on the bill, I'm voting on the bill that's before the floor of the House. And oftentimes those bills have been amended, sometimes dramatically, sometimes not at all. But in this case, with healthcare, you will see dramatic changes in the bill before it moves to the floor. So if you want to see the bill as it was introduced, you can go out on my website and look at that. We have brief explanations of each section of the bill. There's been plenty of analysis uh, on the introduced version of the bill. But I would also encourage you to look at the amended version of the bill as it's moving through. Um, there's also, there have been a lot of questions about end of life and end of life care. My dad died in September. And he died at home. Now, he had a chronic condition. He knew he was going to die. We knew he was going to die. We could have called 911. We probably could have resuscitated him. And we probably could have put him in the ICU for another few days, maybe a week. And Maybe he would have died a week later. Your family too. But, exactly. It, it was my family's choice. But listen, when, when I sat down with the hospital administrators here in town, they talked about the fact that 70% of the health care dollar is spent at the end of life. Now, 70%, I, I, want, you, I want you to help, you know, try to get your head out 70% of the health care dollar is spent at the end of life. Now, we're not talking about cutting people off of life support systems. We're not talking about denying people needed coverage. But I think it's okay to have an adult conversation about whether or not we should reimburse physicians and nurses and caregivers for working with a family and working with a patient. Because right now, they're not reimbursed for that. What they are reimbursed for is that service. So if they say, okay, I'm going to admit you to ICU, you know, yeah, we get reimbursed for it. The hospital gets reimbursed for it. We, we don't get reimbursed for that hour or two hours of counseling that the physicians and the nurses do 
with the family around the uh, typical. Now, let me help you, sir, with all due respect. Because of the fee for service structure, they're not being paid for it. Unlike the Cleveland Clinic, unlike the Mayo Clinic, where physicians are paid on salary, when they're paid the fee for service, unless that particular service is reimbursable, they're not paid for. And that's part of the problem. We need to get to a system where we have compassionate care. We have compassionate care for individuals. We make sure, we make sure that if it is the choice of the family, that those choices are respected and guarded. And we make sure that we do everything possible to, to keep people alive and in quality of life. But we have to accept the fact that we spend 70% of our health care money at the end of the month. Oh, man. There's a reason for that. Oh, shit! Yeah, I owe it! This fellow is one of the crap. You know it. Sir, if you want to curse, then could you please take it outside? It's more. What are you talking about? They're legal people. Um, 